This is the passage that Jesus quotes when he says, this is about me. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, that's basically what we have record of that he quotes in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. But he goes on to say, to proclaim, after that, it says, in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness. Who's they? The ones that are receiving the ministry. The ones that are receiving the healing of the brokenhearted and and getting set free. That we might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. God's ministry is designed to set us free so that he can be glorified. His ministry is designed so that we can participate with him and, and releasing his ministry on earth so that he might be glorified. But look at this, verse 4. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. That's the ones that get set free. And God's design is to set us free so that we can help us free others. And, his, and free people will free people. And we're living testimony of what God did in our lives. We just wanted to share with people. We weren't trying to do anything. We weren't trying to start anything. We just were excited to share what God had done in us. And the truth is, is that we didn't know enough to even know we didn't know. But we just kept praying for people, you know, and that's just what happens. So setting the captives free is designed based on this to try to help us to learn those keys and those things that really is is not that difficult to be used. I've never met a person that really loves God and loves people that doesn't want to be used and doesn't want to be used even more than you're being used at this present time. So seeing the captive is free is for everybody. It's for if you've never really prayed for people, you don't you feel comfortable sharing your testimony, doing things like that, it's for you. If you're praying with people every day, it's for you. Because we talk about everything in there that helps us to be more effective, and that's really what God wants to be. His disciples pray for people. And if we're going to be his disciples, we are too. Now, you can sign up right now. We even have a way that you can, um, on our, I think at the text, you can sign up right now. And um, I think it's coming. Is it coming? There it is. There you go. Sign up right there. You can go to text and sign up. But I just want to encourage you, it's a fun time to come. If you're sitting there going, I'm just, I'm so hurting that I don't think I can do that then you need to come. Because what happens is, is you discover even, you don't have to pray for people, but you discover what sets people free. And once you discover that, you begin to realize, wait a minute, I might need that myself. So it works both ways. So it's really for anybody and for everybody. So I just want to encourage you. We're going to have a really, really good time. Amen? Okay. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about offenses. And uh, in Matthew 18, 7, it says offenses must come. Uh, offenses are basically unforgivenesses. And if you're not here, I encourage you to go online to our YouTube channel to see the message because this issue of forgiveness is huge. Uh, one of the things that we continually tell people is that the depth of your ability to forgive and to not take an offense will really determine the depth and the height of your freedom. Uh, it's the quickest way to get in bondage is to hold unforgiveness. That and being involved in the occult. The, and the quickest way to get free is to forgive. Forgiveness is not about what was done to you. Forgiveness frees you. So I just want to encourage you. Uh, it's available. Freedom is available. And uh, but you've got to choose to forgive. It's what choosing to forgive is, and it's a choice, it's not a feeling. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't feel like forgiving. You choose to obey the word of God and you choose to extend mercy and release someone. It's basically you're choosing to love. You're choosing to love and to release people and love never fails. 
So I just want to encourage you, go to the, um, go listen to the message. It's really very, very important. Uh, I realize that it's a, sometimes it's very difficult. Um, the enemy is always trying to cause a problem in relationships because he knows, that, again, in Matthew, it says that if two agree, the power of agreement is huge. And he knows that a house divided can't stand. So the enemy is always trying to get, wiggle in there and cause an offense an offense literally means a snare or a trap. The enemy is always trying to trap us or to ensnare, or snare us some way to get us to throw that we're either upset with somebody or that we're offended at something or even an institution. Or it's all kinds of things. The enemy, he, does it, he works it all, trying to get us to be offended. And so it really does trap us and it gives him legal access to us. So by choosing to forgive and choosing to not be offended and not taking an offense, by choosing to bless, it really releases us. And so it's so, so powerful. I just encourage you. I, I felt like it was important to, to speak on that again. And I, it's just, just to share briefly so you can go listen to the message. There are so many references in Scripture we could spend a month talking about this. One reference I'll give to you right now if you struggle with this issue, I encourage you to read Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 45. And it's talking about loving your enemy. And, he, and uh, it's, Jesus is basically part of the Sermon on the Mount there. He's just saying, look, you need to love your enemies. Um, he said, what benefit or what, what is it that you can love those who love you? Even lost people can do that. See, the measure of truly being a disciple of Jesus is your ability to love your enemy. Yeah. They got a, a, rou a rousing amen. <laughs> what did Jesus do? He loved us when we were an enemy. You know, he, he demonstrated his love. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't just say, I love you. He went to the cross. And he demonstrated his love while we were still enemies. So it, the power of love is huge. And I don't think we understand that when God says he is love and love never fails, he really means it. And he wants us to understand how to release his love in, in the world around us. Okay. Now, for today. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. And um, even though Chris preached part of my message... Which, he, which we, had, we had not talked at all. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 says, It came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And verse 6 says, And blessed is, is he who is not offended because of me. Very interesting passage. You realize that Jesus is the rock of offense. And turn, if you will, to 1 Peter. Just go ahead and read this next passage also. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. I mean, we could just read that entire before and after that too. I mean, it's amazing what God has done. We're living stones, but Jesus is the rock of offense. And when he says that, it, it, there's a number of references to him being the rock in the Old Testament, the numbers of references to him being a stone. Uh, he is the cornerstone. Everything is built off of him. Everything, he is the, he's everything. And what he's saying is, is that the, he is the rock of offense. Everyone is going to be confronted with the reality of who is Jesus. Yeah. Everyone. And, and, every, and when he says that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, he said that. That's right. And he is. Either he is or he's a liar. Right. There, there's no in-between. He's not a good person, not a nice person. No, he is who he says he is or he's a liar. That's right. Period. The only conclusion you get to. He is a rock of offense. He is offensive. He is going to offend you. He is. Those who believe, it's precious. We become living stones in his, in his building that he is building uh, for a habitation of his presence by the Spirit, we're told in Ephesians. But for those that are disobedient, that stumble over that, they have a problem with that, it's just the way it is. He laid in Zion that, that stone, um, that rock of offense. And, and so we've got to realize that, you know, he says, blessed is he who's not offended. But the true issue is, is that for those of us who are living stones and have embraced that, it's life to us. So what has he called us to do? He's called us, he said, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal, a, a, a kingdom of priests. Actually, it says in Revelations, a holy nation, a special people, peculiar people. Actually, the King James says, I agree with that. <laughs> Some of us more peculiar than others. <laughs> but anyway, we're special people. What are we, we're called to proclaim the praises of him. See, we, we not just, we're not talking about just praising and worshiping. It's talking about living in such a manner that we evoke praise from just, we're, we're a living testimony of Jesus. That's why he called us to be disciples. Only disciples that are going to make a difference for him. It's only disciples that are going to live like Christ that are going to be able to pray for people and see the kingdom of God come, that are going to, to literally affect the world that, that you're around. That's all God's asking us to do. He's not asking us to save the world. He's asking us just to be his representative wherever we are. We're living stones. We're alive because he comes and lives in us. So... Go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. And I want to talk about one other issue here. It's interesting because when you, I've shared this before, but when the Lord showed this to me a long time ago, think about this, John is in prison. Okay, John is Jesus' cousin. John is the forerunner. He is the one who has been calling Israel to repentance and say, there's one coming that's mightier than I am, who not, I'm not worthy to even undo his sandals, but he is going to baptize you with, with uh, water and fire. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit when he's coming. He's one greater and mightier than I am. John the Baptist has been doing that proclaiming. There, he was baptizing them. He said, when Jesus came to be baptized, he goes, whoa. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. John knew who Jesus was, okay? So he had that revelation. So now he's in prison, and he's sitting in prison, and you do, do understand that he knows Scripture. So he knows that Isaiah passage that Jesus quotes and says, this is about me. Today, this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So John's sitting in prison, and he's going, hmm, okay, now, is he the one? I, I, I think he was the one. That's what happens to us too. We get boxed in and we get all kinds of things are crashing in on us. You may feel like you're in a prison. 
you begin to doubt. You begin to waver. John's going, well, if he's the one, obviously he's going to come set me free because that's what it says in Isaiah that he brings release to the prisoners, those who have been taken captive. Well, go, go and ask him. Ask him if he's the one. Because if he's the one, he's obviously going to come. He's going to, he's going to get me out of prison. And Jesus tells him, said, okay, go tell John this. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Is that all he said? Didn't he say, didn't he say something else? He said, yeah. He said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Hmm. He left out. Opening the prison doors. This is John, his cousin, the forerunner. See, why Jesus said this, and I think for us too, is that we have so many times we, we think God's supposed to do something a certain way. I mean, John just couldn't get me. If you're the one, then obviously you're going to come get me out of prison. Uh, no, he didn't go get him out of prison. In fact, John lost his head. And so it's like, this doesn't make sense. But there's a lot of things that have happened in my life that doesn't make sense. There's a lot of things that happen in your life that doesn't make sense. A lot of times we pray and ask God to do things that didn't happen. Mainly because things didn't happen the way we wanted them to happen. And we don't understand a lot of times it's easy, I'm telling you, to get offended at God. It's easy to take, to be, well, you know, I thought it was going to be like this. I thought my marriage was going to be restored. I thought my business wouldn't fail. I thought I would get healed. I thought when I prayed for people, they'd get well. And it didn't happen. And it's easy for us to, you know, what, I'm telling you what the enemy does. He comes in there and goes, yeah, you see, you can't trust God. You know, that little, old, that little old voice says, you know, well, God's not all that good. And what he's trying to do is to back you off, to get you offended with God so that you just keep pulling away. Now, we would never admit that because we go to church. You know, we'd never say, oh, I'm, I'm upset with God. But we might say, well, I'm a little disappointed, you know. But I mean, all that junk is the enemy. I'm just telling you, the enemy is pecking away at us to try to get us to back off from relationship and living in faith and believing, well, I'm going to keep praying for people. I'm going to keep believing and we'll keep doing it. I don't know why. I know years ago when Bill Johnson talked about his father uh, getting cancer and within less than, I think it was like four or five months, he was dead. Uh, they prayed and prayed and prayed. They had seen people with the same thing healed. They had seen a number of people. And Bill talked about the disappointment and the, and the pain that he went through. And, but he said, but I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> God is good and God loves me. I'm not going to let that, this, this happening in my life to change the reality of who he is. And I'm not going to be disappointed in God. I'm going to keep praying for people. I'm going to keep believing. And I'm going to have to live with the hurt of the loss. I'm going to have to live with the mystery I don't understand. But I'm not God. But I know he loves me because he's already gone to the cross and given his life for me. And we've got to do the same thing. Now, don't turn there. But it's worth reading Genesis chapter 4. It's a story of Cain and Abel. It said that in the process of time that Cain and Abel brought a offering to the Lord. One brought the firstling of the flock and one brought the his produce of what he had produced in the, in the soil. It said that God respected Abel's offering, but he didn't respect Cain's offering. <clears throat> Cain got upset. And it says, and God comes to him and it says, why has your countenance fallen and why are you upset? Uh, do you know that Obviously, God is not unjust. So he, they knew that there was the only offering that's acceptable was a blood sacrifice, the firstling, the first of the flock, not the works of your hands and what you can produce. And so he said, look, if you do good, it'll be acceptable. If not, do you know that sin lies at your door and its desire is for you? But now this is before the cross. He said, but you should rule over it. But the picture of what happens when we get offended, what happens is we begin to get angry <clears throat> and we begin to get upset and sin there knocking 
open up, go ahead, uh, let me in. Well, obviously Cain did. He didn't resist and he opened up and said he talked to his brother Abel and in the process of time he, he rose up and killed him. Now, it's a very interesting story. Uh, the, the result of that is that Cain becomes a wanderer and, and, and he is exiled and, and he has to wander. But the, it's interesting because why was Cain upset with Abel? Cain was upset with God. He was mad. He was upset with God because his offering wasn't accepted. But he took it out on his brother. So why I share this is because, see, we do the same thing sometimes. We're, we're upset with God, but we're all believers, uh, hopefully, and we're all in church, so we wouldn't dare admit that we're upset with God, so we get mad with somebody else. Somebody else doesn't do something right. And we take it out on our brother or our sister, and we get upset with them, but the reality is, I think we're, we're upset with God. And I share that this morning because what God wants to do, look, he loves us. He gave his life for us. But how much more can he do? Just because things didn't come out, turn out the way we wanted them to. We prayed for this, it didn't happen. It doesn't change the reality of who God is. We're over here, we're thinking he's got to do something on our schedule. He's got to do something the way that we want it to be done. And it's not subject to us. He's God. But he's a good God. And he's perfect. Now, turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to read this passage, and then in a few, mi in a few minutes, we're going to take communion. And the reason I'm doing this is because the reason... For, let me, well, let's read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Now, this is Paul. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, the reason I want to read this before we take communion and spend a little time here it's because the reality is, is that the, when he talks about the revelation that he got about communion, what he's, this is not a historical event. What we're, what we're getting ready to do is not something that happened 2,000 years ago. Yes, it did. But it's a present reality now. And why he says do this in remembrance of him, because we've got to continually be recalibrated and realigned with reality that Jesus is good and that he gave his life for us. I, I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know what you've experienced. I don't know what you're going through. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he does not change. God's love was demonstrated through the cross. He broke his body so that we could have life. Isn't that amazing? By his stripes, we were healed. So you see, I've got issues in my body. You've got issues in your body. We've had all kinds of different things. He is still the healer. And by his stripes, by, his, by the, the beating that he took, it was for us. The, the punishment that he was punished, it was for us. The blood that he shed... It was all for us. And the death that he died, it was due us. He took it all. And so, I, so communion is not just some ritual we do in church. It's a present reality of acknowledging the reality of that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he paid for is for us. And so it's for us to not just to Take it because this is what we do at church or what you do at home. It is something that is living. He's alive. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, you, every moment of every day, we need to be continually reminded of the reality that Jesus is who he says he is. Right. And, and it's so easy for us to, to 
back up to where I was in, in Matthew, it's so easy for us to get offended because God's not coming through the way that we think he should come through. You know, I did this and therefore, you know, which is we get ourselves into uh, bondage. It says you fall into works in the first place, but we just, we think that. I'm just saying, well, I did this and I was sort of expecting God to do this. He didn't, he's not on our schedule. You know, he's, he, because we think if I do, if I fast more, pray more, if I did this more, if I get prayed more, if do, all these kinds of things, it'll, it'll be better. He's still God, we're not. And so it's so important for us to, to not let those offenses, those little foxes sneak in and drive us to literally back up away from God and out of faith and literally just back us up into no man's land. And that's why communion is so important. Because what it does, it draws us back to the reality. No, this is reality. What you're experiencing will change. It may not change better, but it will change. I can assure you. But Jesus Christ, that's why he said, do this remember to me because I am the same. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we get to partake of him. So it's like, wow. That's why communion is not just some ritual thing we do. It's not just some provision that we do at the church. No, it is a living time to literally experience the presence of God and to literally go, wow. I mean, to focus on the bread. This is your body. Wow. Just as real and alive today as it was 2,000 years ago.